Hello everyone, um, I'm Olivier Constant from Thales. This is Stéphane Boucher from Intel Software, and this is Mathieu Velten from Atos. Um, this morning we are going to tell you about um, the mechanism of model merging, uh, why it is useful in many different situations, and we are going to illustrate that through uh, three industrial applications. First of all, what do we call model merging? Well, we have models that are made of model elements, right? Uh, we have two sets of model elements on this picture. Uh, merging means you first define a mapping between the elements of the two sets. It's called the matching. Uh, it's essentially a bijection between, between subsets of the model elements. So this, this element corresponds to this element, etc. And once you have done that, you can calculate differences between the elements that have been matched. And then later, you can what we call merge the differences, which means essentially um, adding elements, values, data in general, um, transferring it from one model to the other, or conversely, deleting um, data. So basically, it's, it's a very, although it might not look so, it's a very general uh, and flexible mechanism that can be used to transfer data, to align the structures of models, to, of course, report changes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're going to tell you a bit about the EMF diff merge project of which I'm the lead. Um, because this mechanism is so general and flexible, um, the vision within this uh, Eclipse project is to have the merging operation as a primitive uh, consistency preserving operation for model manipulation in general. Hmm. And additionally, to have maximum flexibility, the goal is to be able to operate, to merge, between arbitrary model scopes. Let me illustrate that. A model is a set of model elements. Elements are bound by containment relationships. And there are cross-references. Perhaps the elements are spread within resources, if there's physical storage. And the scope is an arbitrary subset of the elements. And by the way, if somebody is able to draw this kind of figure in PowerPoint with a touchpad in less than one hour, I would be glad that you show me. It was pretty hard to do. <laughs> so anyway, this is the um, vision we have. And the EMF Diffmerge project is essentially a uh, uh, lightweight engine for doing that, uh, aiming at uh, good performance and little memory usage, although uh, comparing models always consumes memory. And it's essentially a feature for building higher level features. So I, everybody, I mean, a lot of people ask me all the time, so why isn't it, isn't it uh, EMF compare? Well, because of that. It's a lightweight engine for building higher level features. Now, let's illustrate the usefulness of these principles through three use cases from the most classical version control to the most exotic. So, Stefan, it's up to you. Thank you, Olivier. So, um, <coughs> My name is uh, Stéphane Boucher. I work, like uh, Olivier said, uh, for Intel Software Division and uh, on a research team based in uh, Nantes. And uh, I will uh, demonstrate uh, a classical use case of uh, merging uh, models through uh, a product uh, called Intel Confluence Studio. So there will be a demonstration uh, just uh, after a few uh, marketing slides. So uh, what's what's your product about? It's uh, um, a modeling and a simulation framework and a tooling that helps uh, hardware designers to uh, predict performances and uh, do uh, actual uh, iteration before the real hardware design. So, uh, more information on the website. Um, we are using Eclipse technologies. Uh, we are based on EMF, of course. And uh, all the other uh, framework we use are displayed here. Um, we have 
GMF and uh, Accelero and GenDoc uh, for, for the modeling uh, part. And for the simulation part, we are using uh, uh, C++. And also, we use the Xtext as uh, another representation of our model. But uh, it's kind of uh, uh, prototyping uh, now. And uh, we are demonstrate the usage of, of uh, EMF differential uh, through the graphical uh, user interface. So, um, the problem we have, and anyone using EMF as in some point of time, uh, the problem is how do you merge, uh, how do you compare models, and how do you merge them? And uh, we have two different scenarios. One is to how to uh, merge it locally through the local history, and how to uh, merge them and use them through the various uh, SCMS like Git. Um, also, for our customers, the solution needs to be sexy. And we don't uh, want to have uh, graphical differences uh, with some math technical labels like edges or nodes or some sign, something like that. Customers know the uh, DSLs uh, concepts, so they don't know technical concepts. And uh, of course, that this is the last bullet, but obviously this is the first uh, thing. Models need to be uh, coherent, and uh, the merging uh, has to uh, to be uh, to be consistent uh, when uh, when the models is merged he has to be to be current and open again do not break the models um, the solution we 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 um, we, uh, we integrated in uh, in your software is to use the image image so as I said first uh, it preserves the, the cohesion of the model so, uh, when we measure the differences. And uh, we also uh, were able to use uh, uh, its uh, extensible API very easily for our own customs needs. And uh, the team, well, Olivier here, I need to, to buy you a beer sometimes. Uh, uh, he's uh, very <laughs> I paid for his dinner, so. He's very, yeah. <laughs> He's very responsive and uh, he's uh, very, very helpful when, when, uh, when we needed uh, some, some apps. So it's great. What we've done? Uh, actually, uh, we integrated in the, in the tool uh, the, compare, uh, the Eclipse Compare Framework. So uh, we, the uh, DiffMage uh, editor I will show you is uh, bounded <coughs> into the uh, com Eclipse Compare uh, actions. Also, we integrated the, the editor through uh, the Git, uh, Perforce, and Subversion uh, uh, source control systems. And uh, we also integrated the logical model. That's kind of uh, technical, uh, but we will see that uh, on the demonstration. And we customized a little bit the, the UI with our own uh, cost, uh, label provider, provider and content providers. Uh, we uh, also uh, tweak a little bit the menus and uh, uh, the versus and uh, uh, loading and saving. Like you said, uh, the scopes of, uh, of our model is quite different. So we, we will be able, be able to integrate very, free, very, very easily and very tuning uh, the, uh, the versus loading. So <coughs> let's do a demonstration. Let's switch. Yes, please. We're going to do something very hazardous. <laughs> Pray that it works. Works? This way. How much time do we have? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes, OK. Oh, less than that. So Two minutes. this is the product. So for people familiar with uh, EMF and GMF, this is a classical GMF uh, uh, di diagram. And uh, the product is uh, to do uh, some kind of uh, boxes. And uh, this example is just a producer consumer uh, system. So the, uh, the, uh, the producer parts uh, produce some, some, some uh, signals to a, a receiver. OK, very, very, very simple example. Uh, for example, I will demonstrate uh, the local story integration. Of I will change uh, some, some properties. On, on this this operation, 
Uh, also, I'll change the diagram and uh, maybe the name of that function. OK. Now I will compare with the local history. So it's Eclipse team framework. So I use the history and the uh, compare with the local history action. And let's compare these two versions. And it brings up the uh, UFD image editor, customized by, by Onin. So if I look at all the differences, I can see that my diagram model has been bonified. The layouts uh, information were uh, different, are different. And also on the uh, semantic model here, I have my attribute that changed from 10 to, uh, to, uh, to 100. So let's merge back, save it, open it back. Here, see, properties, it's back to 10. Perfect. Now let's uh, share it through Git. Sorry. OK. Push everything. Uh, getting started, yeah. Oh, sorry. And make a modification again. For example, once again, move uh, move that, change uh, change that. Okay, have modification. Compare with add. Once once again, totally uh, EGIT uh, interface. I have my uh, I have my differences. Open, just double click on it again. Uh, diff merge editor with my uh, or my my changes, layout of the operation, and uh, init operation. That's it. Let's do let's do let's do it quickly. So back to presentation. We're doing that because of license uh, reasons, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. So uh, this the story ends happily uh, because uh, everything uh, we've integrated to uh, to to a product is actually uh, contributed to uh, EMF diffmerge through uh, Gibit uh, contribution. So. Uh, Everything I've, I've presented and uh, more uh, is, uh, is actually uh, on, on Garrett patches. Uh, we were uh, thinking about uh, doing it for Mars, but unlikely uh, it's not possible. So it will be, I hope, for the next version. Uh, if you want to uh, have new information about that, just go to, uh, to, the, to the forums uh, where I, Every information is so. Uh, Integration is ongoing. We yes, on it. <laughs> that's it. So uh, thank you, and uh, I give you uh, the thank microphone. You. Just because complex logistics. <laughs> okay. It's only to show that we are geeks. So not very useful. So hi, I'm Mathieu. I work for um, Atos uh, Origin. Um, I'm going to present you an industrial use case that has been done for Airbus. Um, so the goal of this project was to have a central database for system architecture. So what is it about? Um, first, let's have a small second diagram explaining uh, um, what it is doing. So the central model is stored in a CDO repository, which is like a uh, Git for models. Um, 
We have uh, several tools around. One which is UML based, which is used to edit um, functionals, functional part. Um, so uh, we commit this model. We transform this model, which is in the UML uh, uh, format, in the eager uh, referentials, and then we commit the model uh, in the repository. Then we can export the functional part to use it on some other design tools. We can export the whole model on part of it according to some uh, OCR rules. We can do some design in the tools and get back um, to the central repository, do the transformation uh, again, and merge it back. So uh, now that I present uh, you, oh yeah, and one step. So since we use CDO, we have uh, all the history. Uh, we have uh, the branches. So we can use the branches, for example, to handle variants of the models, uh, do trade-off, uh, evaluate uh, safety or stuff like that, or cost, or cost analysis. So uh, now I am going to focus on what is done with uh, DeepMerge on the project. Uh, so what happens when you want to talk to a tool? You first export it. So I didn't put it in the slides. Uh, so you can export, like I said, a part of the model. If you export a part of the model, it keeps track of the object that you have export. I will explain uh, later why. So first, uh, the tool model uh, go inside the transformation. You have the, then the model in the eager uh, references. Um, then, if you only export a subset of the model, so if you try to merge it directly in the references model, you will have a lot of <coughs> delay. Since every object that you didn't export is seen as a delay. So what we do is we uh, restrict um, what we merge, so we are merging the part of the model from uh, coming from the tools to a part of the model which is in the repository. So when we are doing the model comparison, we don't see uh, all the objects that we haven't exported as deletion. Um, after computing the model comparison, we have a set of differences. We have some filters that we can apply according to some tool logic or business oriented logic. Um, then we apply the difference. There is a conflict detection. Currently, it's really rough. It's just yes, no. If it's no, uh, you have to go back in your tool. Uh, then we uh, merge the differences really this time, uh, show it to the user that can uh, validate uh, um, the difference and commit. So this is when you are, we are talking with the tool. So now let's see. When we want, we have um, two branches, and we want to merge some uh, of your modification because you are happy with your trade-off. Uh, so in this case, you have uh, two branches. You uh, apply what we call a dataset, which is the filtering uh, functionalities that I was talking about. So in the same principle, we have a subset of um, object, and we merge it in a subset of uh, the other branches with the same, same um, data set. You, you, you usually don't uh, merge a data set in another data set because uh, you lose the fact that, that you use data sets to restrict your functional jobs or your domain uh, responsibility. So um, this is uh, useful so you don't have conflict uh, that you don't want, uh, side effects on other parts of the model that you don't have responsibility on, stuff like that. Um. So now, um, what we did with uh, diff merge uh, was first uh, in integration with CDO. So we customized the match policy. Uh, the match is uh, the first uh, stage of the uh, diff merge that are matching the object uh, of both sides, or three sides where you are using th three ways. So we are based on the CDO ID to do the comparison with some uh, specialties uh, uh, related to the to the functional. So since we have some uh, objects which are also um, matched by a uh, qualified name. And then we also customize the merge policy. Uh, the merge policy is mainly you need a way to set an ID uh, when doing merge. And uh, it's not the same in the, it's not in the EMF uh, API. So we are plugged directly on uh, some uh, CDU API. One more information on that, uh, I can give it. Uh, and we also use a three way merge uh, using the answer store put from the CDO history. So, why three way merge? As you can see here, uh, if two people do some modification, 
one modifies uh, this line, this line, this line, and here, this line. Uh, if you only have these two, you know that there is differences for these four lines, but you don't know which one uh, is okay, is good. Uh, if you have the ancestor, you know who has modified. So if they didn't modify the same light, you, uh, line, you know what to do. So here, instead of uh, having a four uh, case, you don't know what to do. You only have one. Um, happy ending again. So that's the contribution that we will do um, quickly. So we also uh, he talked about model scope, which is the abstraction, uh, the diff merge abstraction regarding models. So the model scope is used to modify or load the model. Um, and we modified it a little so we can track uh, the merge action like uh, the, the drag that has been added or deleted. And uh, we also have uh, some patches for the three-way complete detection. Currently, if you have a deletion on one side and a modification on this deleted element on the other side, you don't see it as a conflict directly. You can see it if you try to merge one because the other one will say you can't merge both. You can't merge the deletion and the modification, but you don't see it directly in the UI. I think it's your turn. <laughs> you brought it? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. Thanks. Mm. All right. So after um, version control, Stefan, after uh, heterogeneous modeling in a version control uh, context, thanks to Mathieu, uh, via, via transformations, let's see something a bit more, uh, uh, I'd say exotic. Um, let me show you about modeling patterns uh, and the uh, technology we've worked on uh, that uh, provides support for modeling patterns in uh, modeling environments that are based on serious technology. Uh, first of all, a pattern in engineering uh, the, usual, the usually accepted definition, it's a, it's a solution to a recurring problem. Uh, now, if we are in the context where engineering is largely based on models, then it makes sense to try and reify and manipulate explicitly this notion of pattern in order to uh, reuse knowledge and disseminate the knowledge of experts. So wh what we call a modeling pattern is a modeling principle but that reflects an engineering pattern. Concretely, um, it is made of data, model elements, constraints, modeling rules, and also graphical representations, which considering the time that users spend uh, lay layouting diagrams is also of, of a significant interest. So I'm going to demonstrate a tool that we have made um, that allows you to uh, you model the usual way, and whenever you're using a pattern, you are going to extract, use a tool to extract the pattern from your model. Then you can store it in a separate file, which is called a catalog, that allows you to reuse the patterns you have defined throughout models. Um, and then later, so you can evolve patterns, you can, you can let models evolve as well, and at some point, whenever you need to check that your model still conforms to the pattern, you can check conformance, and you can also synchronize, update, whenever. It's fun um, for us industry people, so it's <laughs> kind of fun, let's say. Um, all is done through dialogues, there's no programming involved. And diagramming concerns are handled via Sirius, which is pretty convenient. So this was uh, funded by the uh, MERGE uh, ITEA European Collaborative Project on Safety and Security. And it's already open source. Uh, uh, it's a component of the, uh, the Diff MERGE uh, project. OK, let's make a demo. Um, I, will, I will make a demo um, with the uh, Capella uh, system modeling tool uh, within uh, the Polarsys consortium and UML designer. This is Capella. OK, it's a very dummy um, data flow <laughs> that I have made. It doesn't make much sense. It's, about, uh, it's a set of, uh, of functions in system engineering. Um, 
it, it's, it just says it's a pattern about um, uh, data collection from sensors. Um, basically, it says that you first collect data from a sensor, then you have to check the data. Since I have a very good taste, uh, I have chosen very wisely the color and the font to really uh, uh, insist on this, uh, this very important function. Uh, it has two sub-functions. It, it checks the, the range of the, uh, the data. And it, it, whenever there are um, redundant sources of data, it checks the consistency. Uh, and then in the end, in, it synthesizes, if, ever, if everything is OK, a higher level data that can be used for by the rest of the, uh, the system. Uh, I don't pretend it's an actual pattern. Right? It's just for the sake of the demonstration. So we have a model here. Um, we are in uh, project one. And whenever, if this is a pattern and I want to reuse it, I can just select all of these elements. And the pattern tooling is integrated into, uh, into Capella by default. Um, so you can just switch to the, uh, uh, use the uh, pattern contextual menu, and then you, you create, create uh, you select create pattern. And I'm not going to go mu into, uh, into much detail at uh, this stage. Uh, first loading, a bit slow. Um, I'm just going to uh, first form that pops up. must be selected. I need to store my pattern into a catalog. Let's create one. OK. Uh, I have a project to pattern catalog, so I can create it. Catalog one. All right. Uh, this is not a very good name. Let's say it's uh, my pattern. Yeah, I'm very inspired this morning. Um, this is my name. And th there should be a description that explains what the pattern is for, what kind of problem it solves. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, it's pretty clear in this case. Um, then I can just, at this point, if I just want to reuse these elements as they are, I can just click Finish. Done. OK. Now what happened? Well, it, it just created a file here, where, a catalog where I can, I can store as many patterns as I want. Then I switch to another model here, um, which is, well, it's just empty. There's an empty diagram. Here. Now I can reuse this pattern. So I'm in project two. I can click this time apply pattern. And I select this pattern. There's and then OK. Um, it duplicated the data of the pattern into my model. And it displayed um, the elements using the same layout, colors, fonts, uh, et cetera, as in the, uh, the previous model. Um, in order to differentiate it, um, I can do special operations. Um, any element of this pattern and right click, patterns, manage instance. Because I have applied my pattern, this, has the set, this set of elements has become the first instance of my pattern. The second, actually because the elements I used to create the pattern turned out to be the first instance. It gives me a set of functionality that allows me to manage my pattern instance. I can, for example, um, rename the elements in order. I would do that so that we distinguish between the, the two diagrams, right? I'm going to apply a suffix to all elements here. Um, then I can modify my model. Having a pattern does not constrain you in any way. It's just a help to build models. So uh, I can just modify my diagram as I want here, add functions, whatever. Um, and I can modify here, uh, let's say, the summary. OK. Then. Maybe I'm a bit lost because my model evolved and I don't remember uh, where I applied patterns. So I have access to this um, um, instance, pattern instance explorer view that shows me all the catalogs that are used in, my, in the current model, all the patterns that are being used as well. There's only one. And all the instances in my model, there's only one as well. And I can see what elements um, are in it. So I can, uh, where's my instance? I don't remember. Let's double click here. And OK, where is it? I think it's near here, but all oh, right. These are the elements that belong to my instance. Um, obviously, this function does not belong to it. And the other ones, and this port as well, do not belong to it. OK. Um, 
I can also check wh whether I'm still conformant to my pattern. If I click the check button, I see it's, it's OK. Only there are, there's additional stuff compared to the pattern. This is because I have added a function here, and I have added an exchange here. Um, so all right, I can ask for more details. If I click the Detail tab, I have this comparison view that allows me to see what elements have been added, and for example, that the summary of this function has been modified, the value in the instance and the value in the, in the pattern. Um, once I have done that, I can, maybe I want to, um, ah, let, let me do something. Uh, let's remove stuff also. Uh, for example, I don't know, this. OK. Then I'm not conformant at all to my, pa my pattern because I'm missing elements. Obviously, the pattern is violated. If I, if I click check, it says, it says, oh, there's a lot of stuff missing. So OK, I have this. I can synchronize. So I have this Update Instance button. OK. And I clicked it. It recreated the elements and connected them to uh, the, elements that, the elements that remained. So it just displayed them. Then I can reuse the layout. OK. And reuse the uh, fonts. OK, change the uh, bold font here. Uh, now that's fine, but um, there are two levels of conformance. As you can see, uh, all that is in the pattern is present in my model, but I have added stuff. Most of the case, this is what we want to do. But in certain cases, you may want to enforce a strict conformance where there is also nothing more in the instance than in the pattern. In that case, you can click Update Instance, but with the destructive option selected. If I do that, then okay, it removes it removes the additional function here and here the um, the exchange. Okay. Um, now let's see something else. Let's say uh, I want to modify my pattern, evolve it. I'm going to add here an exchange. And now I can update my pattern. OK, it says uh, there, are still, uh, there are additional elements. That's OK. I, want, I will update the image as well. OK. Now if I check my OK, let's save. If I check my second instance, it will say, well, there's stuff missing because the pattern evolved. So obviously, I was conformant. I'm not conformant anymore. I, I'm conformant uh, on version 1.0, as written here. This is not OK. So let's update the instance. And then it added the, additional, the element that was missing. I can reuse layout okay, and style. OK, and now. Now I'm all right. I'm perfectly in sync. So this is obviously a reuse mechanism. It can be used in, in any serious base environment, although it requires some customization to really make sense for the user. Um, you might ask, OK, this is reuse. This is not what patterns are in general. And I, will, I would answer, well, this is the first step. If, you, if we want to have real patterns like the object-oriented design patterns that are well known, we need a reuse mechanism. But we need more. Now I'm, going, I'm not going to go into details, but I'm going to make a demo of the observer design pattern within UML Designer. I hope most of you are familiar with the observer pattern. Um, this is one variant of the observer pattern, one variant. The principle is that uh, it's, it's a class diagram. You have uh, two classes. You have the elements that represent the data, the concrete subject. It may change internally, and they are that observe it and that need to update whenever the uh, concrete subject changes. Okay, so the concrete subject knows a set of observers and there are concrete observers that inherit from the observer abstract class or interface and that know about the concrete subject they uh, are watching and tracking. So let's create, uh, let's create a pattern where I'm not sure I have time actually. So uh, I'm going to just reuse the pattern I have already created. For those who are interested, I can show you how you do the, how you, you build it. Um, um, and the, the key is that we need the notion of role in the pattern. So you create a pattern with three roles: one role for the uh, you, the uh, uh, concrete subject, one for the concrete observer, and one for the uh, observer. Now this is an example where I have a data and a form that reflects that is supposed to reflect the data. So I can apply the observer pattern on it. I will open my catalog. 
And uh, this is a dialog you saw a moment ago, but I, I just clicked finish, remember? a moment ago in Capella. Now I have to click next because I have to assign the roles of my pattern to the model elements I have selected. The concrete subject will be the user data, assign role. The concrete observer will be the, f uh, will be the form. And the observer itself, I don't care. I don't have anything that uh, corresponds to this concept. If I click finish, then the tool tells me, OK, there's an observer class. Where, where should I put it? It's in the pattern. It's not in your model. I say, OK, store it here. And the same for the associations. OK. Now I'm all right. And it did it, meaning that it has merged all the data that was in the pattern and the, the uh, data we had in the model. And then there, and we have all these uh, change tracking and evolution mechanism that I showed a moment ago that will, that will work as well. One other thing, I have added to the observer role a uh, constraint in OCL. Um, I can, if I browse my catalog, um, here, browse. I can see in, the, in my pattern that the observer has a constraint, self.isAbstract. This is OCL. I, um, this is an embedment of the OCL editor with uh, syntax uh, completion and highlighting. And indeed, if I select my instance, oh, no, sorry. Um, if I um, modify the, uh, the is abstract attribute, uh, then I will have an error um, that, that will say, uh, it will state, OK, uh, this should be abstract, and it's not. And it's really integrated. Um, I, I won't have time to show anything else. But if you're interested, I will show you all the functionalities. Um, there are still a lot that I didn't show. Um, the idea is to reuse, disseminate know-how, and enforce modeling rules, uh, all uh, with, with one tool, and manage layout. OK, I'm done. A bit late, sorry. Um, OK, now uh, don't forget to uh, put a plus one or a minus one, but I prefer the first option uh, for this talk, if you have appreciated or send, send feedback so that we can improve. Now, if you have any question uh, for any of us, uh, please do not hesitate. Uh, sorry, I, I forgot one slide because, yeah, I'm more, more late than that. It would be too easy. Um, because, uh, because people usually think about version control when we say diff merge, and it's really not only that because we are really an engine. We are thinking about renaming uh, the project to EMF Convergence to convey the idea that it's really an engine for making parts of models converge, align on each other in general. So we discussed about that with Wayne and... Uh, we need to discuss with PMC, but OK, that's something we, we have in mind and that we'll probably do if uh, users agree. OK.